I'm going to talk today about skepticism in rather general terms. I mean, we'll get to some more technical details later, but I, I, I want to um, really ask two questions. Um, what is skepticism and why is it a problem? Um, if indeed it is a problem. And what, if anything, we should do about it? And uh, how we should go about doing what it is that we should do? As is general in my work on skepticism, I, I divide uh, historically significant skeptical arguments into two broad families that I call Agrippan and Cartesian. Um, the Griffin skepticism is centered on what's often thought of as the problem of the regress of justification. I'll say more about that in due course. Uh, Cartesian skepticism makes essential use of so-called skeptical hypotheses or scenarios. Uh, the original one being Descartes' evil deceiver case. And of course, as we all know, um, this idea is now in kind of technological guise made its way deep into popular culture and films like The Matrix. Um, I actually knew it had penetrated deep into popular culture in London. Uh, I first found out some, some years ago when um, I stopped outside a little joke and magic trick shop in, in Covent Garden, I'm not sure that it's there now, and noticed that I was able to buy a brain in a vat keyring, uh, which, which I did, and I, I now wish I brought, I bought a large number of them because I thought I could have given them out as prizes for the best undergraduate essay in epistemology in, in my introductory course, but uh, chief gate that I was, I only bought one of them. Um, I'm going to focus today principally on a grip and skepticism. Um, even though, I think, in the literature there's probably still a tendency to make Cartesian skepticism the main, the main focus of interest. I happen to think, for reasons which will come out, that a Griffin skepticism is in some ways more fundamental. As a matter of fact, I think that if you get your response to a Griffin skepticism right, then you know how to deal with Cartesian skepticism too. Um, if I get time, I'll indicate why I think that's so, um, but but I do want to leave time for discussion. So if I don't if I don't get time, um, then we'll leave that for another day. Perhaps I'll just make a few very brief remarks. Okay. Um, well, with respect to the first question, why is skepticism a problem, or at least a problem for philosophers? Um, I take it that the answer is that skepticism involves unacceptable arguments, unacceptable conclusions, or un unacceptable doctrines, possibly damaging doctrines, supported by what at least seem at first sight to be compelling arguments. Maybe not to everybody, but at least to a lot of people. Um, I think in, in deciding what to do about skepticism, though, it's important to actually analyze both of these notions, the unacceptability of skeptical conclusions and the apparently compelling nature of skeptical arguments. So, so why are skeptical conclusions um, unacceptable? Skeptic, skeptics question the possibility of knowledge. Uh, perhaps they even say that um, there is no such thing as knowledge or we don't have any knowledge. Why is this conclusion Unacceptable. Why isn't it just a useful thing to have discovered? I mean, it may sound counter-commonsensical, but so what? Um, flouting common sense is often a precondition of intellectual progress. Um, if we weren't prepared to flout common sense, we'd still think that the sun went round the earth. Um, well, In approaching skepticism, I, I've been recently making use, I won't make a great deal of use of it today, but I'll, I'll introduce it, the idea of a skeptical stance. I think skeptical stances in philosophy are rather complex, and, and they typically have at least two components. One is a doctrinal component, some kind of thesis, some kind of theoretical claim about knowledge, a claim in epistemology, e.g., there's no knowledge. And a suspensive component, 
and it, um, possibly mediate by, by a prescriptive component. But the suspensive component consists in actually modifying your epistemic practice, so to say, in the light of the doctrinal conclusion, giving something up, ceasing to claim knowledge, um, for example. This uh, suspensive component, I think, is in contemporary philosophy often vestigial. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's never entirely absent, oddly enough. I mean, I think uh, the idea that, that the skepticism is held without effect seems to me to be wrong, and, uh, and I'll say something about that in a few moments. But let's focus first on the doctrinal component, because that's what I'm going to be talking most about today. I mean, since the doctrine, of course, isn't plucked out of the air, um, but is in fact the emerges as the conclusion of an epistemological argument, we could also call it the theoretical component. Uh, I sometimes don't, because that theoretical practical sounds like, you know, factual, moral, or science, you know, skepticism about science versus skepticism about practical reasoning. That's not what I have in mind. So uh, that's incidentally why I, why I opted for doctrinal versus suspensive. I wanted to, I wanted to head off possibility of misunderstanding there. But so if we focus on the dialect, on the, on the doctrinal aspect of skepticism, I think we find three important features of the conclusions of the most effective or troubling skeptical arguments. And the first is that they're hyper-general and therefore undiscriminating. So philosophical skepticism um, is quite distinct from what we might call critical skepticism, which is what people often mean by skepticism in ordinary life, and, and when they wish there were more skepticism about. I mean, when people wish there were more skepticism about, they wish that people weren't so credulous. They wish that people paid a little more attention to evidence or reasons and weren't perhaps so quick to go along with the crowd or whatever. Of course, people disagree about whether, you know, about where such skepticism is justified. Um, but nevertheless, many people think it wouldn't be so bad if there was more of it about. But critical skepticism is in its nature discriminating. I mean, it implies that, you know, if you aren't doing things, um, you could do better than you're doing. But philosophical skepticism like that, of course. I mean, the philosophical skeptic typically said, when he questions the possibility of knowledge, is suggesting that maybe we don't have any knowledge whatsoever. So this hypergenerality implies that, that it's not discriminating. In fact, it cuts the ground. It, if you really took it seriously, it would cut the ground from under the possibility of critical skepticism. I mean, you couldn't be very easily or very obviously, couldn't. it's not obvious how you could be both a critical skeptic and a, a general skeptic at the same time. Hume seems to have attempted to, to uh, pull this particular trick off. And it's an interesting question as to how at all he manages it. But uh, um, I, mean, I don't know whether you know that. It's the wonderful joke at the end of the um, chapter on miracles in the inquiry where Hume says, uh, not merely was the Christian religion attended at its inception with miracles, at this day it cannot be believed without one, he says, because anyone who believes it is conscious of a continuing miracle in his own soul, by which all the principles of his understanding are subverted, you know. Uh, but then you think, yeah, but who's the joke on here, you know, because uh, Hume's someone who himself appears to believe that in some fairly strict sense all our beliefs are groundless, and merely, so to say, the causal outcome of natural processes. <laughs> so, um, you start, feel, you, st you start to think, well, either the possibility of religious belief shows that huge psychology is inadequate, um, or you should be more careful about, you know, claiming uh, who's, uh, who's rational and who isn't, uh, or possibly both. I mean, um, okay, so unacceptable, so hyper-general. Um, I think the second point to make is that the most interesting forms of skepticism are radical, at least as I use the word. Um, if there's a problem about knowledge, it's, a prob it's because there's a problem about justification. So I distinguish radical skepticism from what I call sometimes high standard skepticism. I think that one of the defects of much of a good deal of contemporary epistemology, there's been a great fashion for a view called contextualism. And the idea is the skept that skeptical arguments produce an illusion by in effect shifting by raising the contextually appropriate standards for claiming or attributing knowledge. Um, even though I call myself in a certain sense a contextualist, I find this uh, fashionable form of contextualism 
um, inadequate. Largely because I think it's very difficult to see how it works for anything better than high standard skepticism. Well, it seems to me the most interesting forms of skepticism are not high standard skepticism. I mean, when you really follow them through, they make you wonder whether you have any reason whatsoever to believe what you believe, or whether any beliefs are, so to say, epistemically more respectable than any others, or whether, as the ancient skeptics said, it's all a matter of opinion. So, so, so radical. And in the third case, it seems to me that doctrinal skepticism in its most significant form is modally strong. The skeptic doesn't just say we don't, as a matter of fact, have any knowledge, you know, so that we might get some if we worked longer hours or, you know, paid more attention. The thought is that there's some in principle um, obstacle to our achieving knowledge. Perhaps buried in our ordinary epistemic practices, in fact, is a hidden paradox that the skeptic brings to light. Starting from the assumption we do have knowledge, we find that it's very hard to see how we possibly could. Or just reflecting on certain elementary demands that we would impose on any concept of knowledge, not some particularly exalted one, we're led to wonder whether we really could meet those demands in simple as they seem. So I think what, now I think that when you put those three things together, hypergenerality, radicality, and modal strength, you have a view that's very, very difficult to swallow. Um, one of the things I pointed out earlier is it seems to undercut the kind of critical skepticism uh, many in this room would naturally think to be a good thing. Anyway, what I want to say here is that skepticism is more than contingent ignorance. That really matters. It's more than contingent ignorance. It's an in-principle problem about making epistemic distinctions. Um, now, I think in practice, of course, you can't not make epistemic distinctions. <laughs> um, and in practice, you certainly can't um, give up believing things just because skeptics think that the beliefs aren't adequately supported. So, um, this, of course, invites Hume's response, which is that skeptical arguments are therefore ineffective. And if they're ineffective, effective, there's no need to refute them. Um, we could put, in terms of my distinction between doctrinal and suspensive skepticism, we could put Hume's point by saying that doctrinal skepticism has no suspensive consequences. I mean, it may rationally suggest suspensive consequences, but it cannot induce suspensive consequences. And since the consequences are what we care about, then really there's much less interest in the doctrine than you might otherwise think. That seems to me to be the essence of the Humean response to skepticism, which is somewhat popular. Still, in some circles, Strawson toyed with a, a version of this. Um, I think contra Hume, though, um, the first of all, um, the no consequences claim is vastly more plausible in the case of Cartesian than of a Griffin skepticism. Um, I guess nobody really thinks he or she is in the matrix. I mean, if anyone in this room did, this would be a case for psychiatry, not a case for philosophy, it seems to me. Um, but the Griffin argument, I think, is another matter. I happen to think, I won't defend the view here, but I happen to think it's one of the principal drivers in postmodernism and contemporary cultural relativism. The idea that, so to say, everyone lives in his or her own matrix of epistemic norms, perhaps culturally distinguished, and that therefore these uh, different outlooks on the world cannot, so to say, be compared. I, uh, this, I mean, the, the, the argument for this is often tricked out with anthropological fact or alleged anthropological fact, but I think without the support of the Agrippan argument, it's very far from clear what the mere anthropological facts entail. Uh, I think failure to make that distinction actually lies behind the thought that Wittgenstein is some kind of relativist. I think he isn't. Uh, 
So that's, that's my first response. The second response, I think, is that even if Hume were right, it wouldn't necessarily mean that skepticism wasn't of interest to people with a philosophical turn of mind. Because it seems to me that skepticism is actually a profound challenge to philosophy. Um, if you think, as I do, with Stellos, that philosophy is the attempt to understand how things in the largest sense of the term hang together in the largest sense of the term. It's surely part of our self-conception that we can indeed legitimately make epistemic distinctions. And if we can't understand how that's possible, then we can't understand how things in the largest sense of the term hang together in the largest sense of the term. We don't really understand our place in the scheme of things. And I think that means that Hume's psychological response, we're going to believe things no matter what, is inadequate. We really want to understand, so to say, the epistemic language game in ways that insulate it or save it from the paradoxes that the skeptic claims to draw from. And a third thing that I think is that we also ought to avoid responses that are unnecessarily concessive. And Hume's response, the Humean response, and it's not alone in this, is, is concessive. I mean, Hume effect, in effect says the skeptic is right in one way but wrong in another. He's right theoretically, at least as far as I can see, but wrong to suppose that much follows. And by the way, I think that's true of a good deal of contextualism. They think skepticism is right by high standards, but not it's what the skeptic says is true in a high standards context, but false in an ordinary or lower standards context. But I don't think that what the skeptic says is true ever. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, there would be, or at least it would be more desirable uh, if, one could, if one could say that. Okay, so so much for unacceptability. What, what about um, appeal? Well, I think that skeptical arguments are appealing because they seem to be, in the term I use, uh, intuitive. And by intuitive I mean not dependent, or anyway not obviously pen dependent, on contentious theoretical ideas about knowledge or justification. I mean, if they were, then one could of course use the unacceptability to argue via modus tollens for getting rid of those ideas. I mean, if, if, uh, you might think, well, what's the point of theorizing? You must be theorizing knowledge incorrectly if, as a result of your theorization, you come out with something that's, so to say, wildly at variance with the surface f features of ordinary epistemic practices. But I think the, what makes skepticism um, troubling is it's not at all obvious that it is theoretically loaded in quite that way. Um, skeptical arguments seem to, ap to appeal only to pretty much lowest common denominator ideas about knowledge or justification, ideas that pretty much anyone is going to concede um, when they're brought to his or her <coughs> attention. And it seems to me that if this is right, um, then, to, then um, a number of things follow methodologically. I've already said we don't want a concessive response. Um, I'd now like to say that it means that skepticism should be approached dialectically, sorry, diagnostically, and not merely dialectically. That's to say, we don't merely want to be told that the skeptic is wrong, or perhaps in a way even shown that the skeptic is wrong. It would be ideal to be shown that he's wrong in a way that explains his initial appearance of being right. I think that would be a the most desirable form um, of that way. That's the only kind of diagnosis which I, I don't want to sound like a Freudian here, which I'm not, but you have to, as it were, you know, the only way you can come to terms with the skeptical tendencies in yourself is to, as it were, come to grips with the appeal. Uh, with the initial appeal of the arguments. So the aim of what I've always called, I, I call theoretical diagnosis, namely finding in skeptical arguments unacknowledged theoretical commit or disguised theoretical commitments, is to dispel the illusion of intuitiveness while accounting for its presence. That is my adequacy condition on an understanding of philosophical skepticism. <laughs>
I think this is reasonable. After all, you know, if you look back over the history of philosophy, philosophers have been refuting the skeptic for over 2,000 years. I mean, you really do get the impression the skeptic's been refuted a bit too often. <laughs> you, know, that, um, you know, I mean, if somebody needs to be refuted this much, maybe the person is onto something, you know. Uh, we do protest too much. Like Lady Macbeth, we philosophers do protest too much, perhaps. Anyway, so, however, here's the, here's the, here's the, here's the, uh, the, the, the old dog's new wrinkle on its old tricks. Um, I think the way to actually conduct um, this project of theoretical diagnosis in a more um, methodologically self-conscious way is to admit that I'm doing it from a broadly pragmatic perspective. And um, I'll put some flesh on the bones um, of these claims as I go along, but there's really th there are really three um, methodological commitments of pragmatism, or as it, as it exists in philosophy today, that I that I want to emphasize. I mentioned two on the handout. Actually, I'll mention one later, but I'll mention all three now. Um, the first is linguistic priority. That's to say, I'm going to initially um, focus not so to, uh, on epistemic vocabularies and thus on epistemic concepts rather than so to say on epistemic phenomena um, and I'll explain why I mean it's not obvious that's a correct move I mean you know um, if you want to know more about the nature of electrons you wouldn't focus necessarily on the vocabulary of subatomic particles, you'd wonder about the subatomic particles. So you might say, well, if you want to get clear about knowledge and justification, why are you focusing on the vocabulary rather than on, as it were, knowledge and justification? Well, I'll explain as I go along why I'm doing that. I don't think, I don't think knowledge is much like electron. I don't you'll see that I don't think that, that the so-called phenomena are anywhere the, are theorizable to the same degree. Um, epistemological behaviorism is a term I, I've recovered from Richard Rorty's groundbreaking book, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, um, and it involves looking at epistemic vocabularies through the lens of epistemic practices conceived as publicly socially enacted practices in this case of evaluation uh, this can look question begging because it's a third person approach it's no more question begging than contemporary externalism but then many people think that contemporary externalism doesn't get to grips with skepticism either because skepticism often seems most compelling when we adopt the first person perspective and ask ourselves how we know things not how someone looking at us from the outside I mean you probably noticed that um, this is this is a rock on which um, these uh, you know, popular films like The Matrix typically found that, right? I mean, we're looking at the outside, you know, right? Um, so somehow, when Keanu Reeves drinks the Kool-Aid, he all of a sudden, you realize, falls into a water and uh, realizes he's not actually a computer programmer in the late 20th century in New York, but actually a battery. Um, busily violating the second law of thermodynamics by getting more out than goes in and keeping the matrix going, you know, right? Um, of course, if you look at it from the, that seems fine, we're from the outside, but if you look at it from the first person's perspective, you might wonder how on earth he could know that this just wasn't, as it were, an extra particularly teasing wrinkle in the, in the virtual reality simulation. Uh, so, you know, I, I call this, when I talk to my undergraduates about this, I call this the Moorian moment in, in the movie. You remember when Moore holds up his hand and says, here is one hand, there is another, so I prove there's an external world. So this is like, here I just fell into some water. Uh, so now I know I'm in the matrix. <laughs> you know, um, It's the Moorian move. You might wonder, if you're looking at things from a first-person perspective, what on earth makes this move legitimate? Well, I'm going to, I don't think that my approach is actually uh, question begging, but I think it takes some showing that it's not. Um, and I can't really do that until I've got more of the apparatus out in full view.
Um, the third dimension is, is um, pragmatism about norms, a phrase I'm borrowing from Robert Brandom, and I'll say what that is in due course. Let me just say this, though. I do think that in a suitably qualified form, skepticism about philosophy is indeed the key to seeing our way beyond philosophical skepticism. And this sounds concessive in its own way, particularly given that I said that skepticism is a challenge to philosophical understanding. However, I don't think that it is. This is because I hold that not all understanding is theoretical. There's such a thing as phenomenological understanding of the sort that we get in Austin, Wittgenstein and the early Heidegger. So it's not, it's not a threat. So a threat to philosophical theorizing is not AO ipso, a threat to philosophical understanding. The philosophical problem might have the form I don't know my way about, as Wittgenstein says, and we might, through phenomenological investigation, come to know our way about better and understand things better. So there's a form of understanding as perspicuous vision, uh, perspicuous representation. But I don't think that has to be theory. In, in, a, in any very demanding sense of theory anyway alright so having said that let me say a little now about uh, epistemic concepts well I've already suggested that epistemic discourse is normative or evaluative um, a justified belief in my view is one that it's epistemically appropriate to hold or one that one is epistemically entitled to hold um, since, by definition, beliefs are never more epistemically appropriate or one's entitlement is never better than when they amount to knowledge, um, anyone who, who knows that P, in my view, is justified in believing that P. But that's just terminology. The interesting question is, what, are, on what factors um, does justification depend? I mean, you know, in other words, I haven't begged the question against reliablest epistemology, because after all, um, epistemic appropriateness might depend on uh, reliability in one's cognitive processes as, as external as reliable things. So, so that's just terminology when I say that knowledge implies justification. But it's worth clearing this up because tr much traditional epistemology is justification in the far stronger sense. And the stronger sense is this, that, that the justification is essentially connected with being able to justify. And this view, this approach is generally thought internalist because, after all, if being able to justify, for example, by giving, uh, involves being, uh, giving reasons, then, after all, you're going to have to know what your reasons are, what their reasons for, perhaps why their reasons. So, um, on this stronger a more specifically justificationist approach to epistemology, um, justification is going to depend on factors that we have, to which we have cognitive access, which we may even have to know about, as a matter of fact. We may have to have justified beliefs about how we form justified beliefs. Now, externalists, of course, uh, which is a very pop externalists very popular today, externalists reject this traditional view uh, altogether. Um, they argue that belief amounts to knowledge or is perhaps justified when it's formed and retained through some appropriately reliable cognitive process. Or when it tracks the truth, as Nozick says, or when it's safe, as Sosa says, in the sense that it couldn't easily have been false. I mean, all these in one way or another are modal conditions. Uh, reliability is a modal condition too. So, I mean, um, but of course the critical thing here is you only have to satisfy the favoured modal condition, you don't have to know that you do. Um, and this view, of course, has many attractions. It, it smoothly accounts for animal knowledge, which is a, it turns out to be of a piece with human knowledge. Um, it's consonant, for that reason, with the predominantly naturalistic tendency of contemporary Anglophone philosophy. Um, Nevertheless, and it, and it does have something to say about skepticism. Namely, that skepticism is an artifact of, the, of internalism. Nevertheless, I think that externalism is wrong. <laughs> uh, and um, 
As a matter of fact, I don't think. I, I think it's wrong in, in two ways. First of all, I think it's wrong in its account of epistemic concepts, at least as they apply in the case of human knowledge. And secondly, I don't think skepticism is an artifact of justificationism and or internalism. I think it's an artifact of a specific variant of justificationism or internalism, which is by no means the same thing. So I think that while externalist insights do need to be respected, pure externalism needs to be rejected. I'm not going to argue this, but let me say um, dogmatically, I mean I'll argue it by presenting the view in a way I hope you'll find this plausible, but let me say right now, in my view, justification is part of the externalist, essentially connected with the ability to justify, including the ability to give reasons. And I get to one of the quote from Sellers that John McDowell calls Sellers' master thought to characterize a state or episode as one of knowing is not to give a naturalist description but to place it in the logical space of reasons of justifying and being able to justify what one says unquote, hence the title of my paper now I said that epistemic vocabulary is normative vocabulary in fact I think it's a species of deontic vocabulary, that's to say it's at home in the language of permission and obligation The primary function of epistemic vocabulary, I think Austin was one of the first to see this very, very clearly, is to claim or attribute authority or entitlement. Or, I mean, entitlement to assert, assertional entitlement, a, a, a entitlement to rely on a statement in inference, or an inferential entitlement, um, to inform, all those things. Um, that's the primary um, function of it and as a matter of fact it's in virtue of this primary function if I had more time to talk about pragmatism about particularly use theoretic approaches to meaning I'd flesh this out it's in virtue of this primary function that, it ha that, that our epistemic vocabulary has its particular semantic features I mean I, I, um, I think this is an idea that um, Edward Craig um, has had a lot to do with in his book Knowledge and the State of Nature a book that I think deserves to be better known than I mean it's, it's well enough known but I think it deserves to be even better known than, <laughs> than it is uh, um, now getting down to brass tacks though I, I, I think though um, that the key deontic concept in understanding um, justification or epistemic entitlement is epistemic responsibility that entitlement derives from epistemically responsible belief management forming and retaining your beliefs in a way that is so to say up to scratch epistemically I don't think, as I said, this is a blanket rejection of externalist insights. I happen to think that knowledge, as opposed to justification, requires responsible, well, as opposed to justification understood in a certain narrow way, requires both responsibility and reliability. And I think what we really need to understand is how these two components mesh in, in our epistemic practices. I think that skepticism suggests that we can't accomplish this. I think, by the way, this is this understanding of skepticism is one of the drivers of the first meditation sorry, of the meditation, not the first meditation but the, but the recurrent skepticism once Descartes has formulated the principle of clear and distinct perception he wants to know how even being guided, in other words, by this principle in other words, being maximally epistemically responsible he can nevertheless reflectively ensure himself that he's being led to true beliefs rather than false beliefs. That just is the project of connecting responsibility with reliability. So I think actually analyzing knowledge into these two aspects gives you an interesting insight into why skepticism is a challenge to epistemology as traditionally been conceived. Okay, um, let me now move on to the Agrippan problem then with all this you know, background apparatus. Okay, well the Agrippan problem turns around what um, what I like to call Agrippa's trilemma 
I'm not really certain. I think I invented this phrase, although I never got any credit for it, but I'm not sufficiently certain to actually insist, because I think maybe out there somewhere, in the vast sea of philosophical literature, somebody else was using the phrase before me. I just don't happen to know who it was. Um, Papa calls it freezes trilemma for some reason. You know, uh, you know uh, it seems to me getting it, you know, more than 2,000 years too late, so to say. I mean, some obscure Austrian philosopher of the early 19th century. It's also been called Munchausen's trilemma. Again, though, I think, a little bit late. Um, I call it a Griffith trilemma, for, as you all know. Um, its first clear appearance is in the writings of Sextus Empiricus, where it's attributed to the skeptic Agrippa, about whom we know nothing more than that he invented this argument. So it's... Uh, well, it's prefigured in Aristotle, perhaps, but not with a, in the posterior analytics, but not with a skeptical inflection. Um, anyway, so what's the guts of the trilemma? Well, here you go. Here's one version. Suppose I represent myself as knowing, or at least having a justified belief, that things are thus and so. I may not use explicit and uh, epistemic vocabulary in this way. I may just speak in an authoritative way, inviting you to rely on me. Um, the skeptic, possibly myself, in a reflective frame of mind, then raises the question, how do I know? Or what gives me the entitlement to speak in this um, authoritative way? Who in response, um, either to an interlocutor or to myself, um, I offer my evidence or my credentials, something anyway, that, uh, on which entitlement supervenes. Of course, the skeptic then renews his question. Well, what you've just uh, introduced into the conversation, is that something that you know or are entitled to introduce or just an opinion you happen to have? And it instantly seems that this game has no obvious end. That the que that whatever I say next, the question can be reiterated. So now it seems that we have three options. The trilemma, and they're all bad. I can either keep trying to find something new to say, in which case I embark on an infinite regress, and it's vicious because I'm not justified at the beginning unless per impossibility I'm justified, well, generally thought per impossibility. I'm just, I've already, as it were, you know, got in place all these other things that I'm now happily, rapidly trying to discover or articulate endlessly. The only person I know who thinks it's not vicious is Peter Klein at Rutgers, but uh, um, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, at some point, I could just refuse to answer. I could tell the skeptic to get lost, in which case the skeptic will say fine, but in which in that case your knowledge is real, your so-called knowledge derives ultimately from a mere assumption. Or I could end up recurring to something I've already said. I can repeat myself, in which case the skeptic will say, ah, so now you're going round in a circle, a paradigmatically poor form of reasoning. In no case do I explain how I know. In no case do I give a satisfactory answer to the skeptic's original question. Yet, the skeptic says, there is no fourth option. And this is the fatal trilemma. I think we can see in practice that the real threats are assumption and circularity. After all, I mean, who can answer these questions more than two or three deep? I mean, um, I also think that the question, the Grippen strategy, is particularly vivid when applied to so-called epistemic norms or standards, because, of course, the skeptic is apt to say, you can't validate your scientific outlook except by appealing to results of, the, of your scientific outlook, and that's circular. And if other people have a more you know, spiritual or, um, or magical, or whatever you like, outlook, who are you to say? Everyone has his or her, own, all cultures have their own narratives. Uh, um, with epistemic criteria inbuilt, so to say, and therefore cannot be judged from the outside. I think that's the form of the Agrippan trilemma that remains enormously influential um, right now. Now, so I think, obviously not everybody does, I think, A, it's a bad thing, the outcome of the, the skepticism that results from the trilemma, and B, I think the people who claim to think it's not a bad thing are typically insincere. Here I agree with you. That people say they welcome the results, but nobody behaves in practice uh, as if uh, 
as if he or she believes the results. Um, so, um, so it seems to meet the unacceptability criterion I, I, I laid down earlier. What about the intuitiveness criterion? Well, I think it does pretty well on, 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 on that too. I think one of the interesting features of skeptical arguments is they're extraordinarily compact compared with the epistemology books that are written to refute them. You know, I mean, Agrippa's, the Agrippan modes in Sextus Empiricus take up a page. The first meditation in Descartes takes up a page and a half. Compare this with, you know, the critique of pure reason, or even more, the phenomenology of spirit, you know. I mean, you start to think, you know, my grip on the problem is a lot more secure than my grip on the solution, you know. Uh, um, so I think we have to level the playing field. We bet, we'd better argue, and this is now a further um, justification of theoretical diagnosis, it had better be the case that um, the appearance of intuitiveness is misleading. If it's not, uh, the anti-skeptic is, is dialectically in a very, very poor position. Um, well, I think it's obvious the way to go. Now, going back to my initial account of the of, of unacceptable I think we should now go back from intuitiveness to unacceptability and I think the place to focus is um, um, on generality it, it, it seems to me part of the reason the Agrippan argument seems intuitive is that we've all in fact found ourselves in what I like to call as of yesterday an Agrippan rut uh, uh, arguments where you know people end up shouting at each other basically. So, argument clinic, right? Tis, isn't, is, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it can happen, right? It can happen, it does happen. But of course, that's not the skeptic. The skeptic's view isn't the claim that we can get into um, a grip and ruts, but that we're always in an a grip and rut, whether we know it or not. And here, I think, then, we see that there's a move that might well be a danger. Namely, that of overgeneralizing from what Dewey calls specific problematic situations to a general epistemic predicament. So the question then to ask, it seems to me, is how do we have to think about knowledge, or which of course means justification, which for me means epistemic uh, concepts, which for me means epistemic practices, how do we have to think about all these to, as it were, justify the generalization? Well, in accordance with the pragmatism that I sketched at the beginning, to ask how entitlement is acquired or lost is to ask about the deontic structure, particularly, specifically the entitlement structure, of our practices of epistemic assessment. In accordance with pragmatism about norms, as Brandon calls it, normative statuses, i.e. standings, whether things are entitled, not entitled, whether they're permissible, whether they're obligatory, are instituted by our practice of taking normative attitudes towards each other. In that sense, they're not different from, say, to say, the rules of soccer. The rules of soccer belong to namas, not fusis. The, the, the status of offside is instituted by our practice of counting some players as offside and other players as onside. Nobody was born offside, I mean, except possibly <laughs> metaphorically. You know, right? I mean, <laughs> um, okay, so what structure is, does the Agrippan argument presuppose? Well, I think the first sign that something about it is bad is that it will not support the relevant generalization without presupposing a severe form of what I call claimant-challenger asymmetry, which I sum up below as CCA. If I represent myself as knowing that P, that is nothing you have to do or no way that things have to be in order for you to have the right to enter an epistemic challenge, i.e. to ask me how I know.
On this view, claimants are always in a position of needing to have earned entitlement, which challengers have an unrestricted right to question. And I think if this view is in place, if this view of the structure of our practice of reason giving entitlement structures in place, then all the skeptic is doing is asking a claimant to make explicit the basis of his or her implied epistemic authority. And why not? Now, I said earlier that skeptical arguments need to be intuitive. That's part of their appeal. I think it's important to realize, though, the skeptic himself is committed to their being intuitive. They really... Um, that's because, of course, for the reason I gave. I mean, if they don't... If skeptical problems don't emerge, so to say, from uncontroversial aspects of epistemic practice, um, then the skeptic is simply rigging the rules so to get a conclusion. I mean, he won't be talking about knowledge or justification as we enact it, but some, so to say, specially rigged account of justification that induces the paradox. The paradox will be an artifact of an unacknowledged theorization. Now, of course, look looking at things another way, going back to the trilemma and the way it generates an initial threat of regress, it does so because CCA permits free challenges. Challenges to knowledge claims, if CCA is in place in the entitlement structure, don't require grounds. You don't have to have a reason to question somebody. You've been handed the reason by the very fact of a knowledge claim implicit in, or explicit or implied, having been made. You have an ex, the challengers have an ex-ante entitlement um, to make their challenges. Nor does, and in particular, the challenger does not have to suspect any specific deficiency, which might give a reason for entering the challenge. Any specific deficiency on the part of the um, claimant. You know, bad evidence, poor lighting if it's a perceptual claim, you know, too far away. You wouldn't know a Ferrari if you were standing next to one, never mind at six blocks distance. Yeah, I mean, whatever, you know, you think about the claimant, right? You don't know a hawk from a handsaw, unlike Hamlet. Um, but it seems to me that CCA, in fact, is a, is a, is a, is a dreadful distortion of ordinary epistemic practice. And if I'm right, then the Agrippan argument is not intuitive, even though it ought to be. What we really should do is start from the falsity of CCA, having uncovered it, and reverse engineer our account of the structure of everyday epistemic assessment to see what its true entitlement structure really is. And ideally, we would do it in a way that stays much closer to the phenomenology of everyday acceptance, uh, 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 everyday claiming and challenging, and doesn't require, so to say, ad hoc hypotheses to, as it were, account for the gap between the theorization and the phenomenology. And I think it's a feature of, of traditional skeptical arguments that though they start simple, they realize, the skeptics are soon made to realize in the course of the dialectic that there is a gap between their implied epistemic views and the phenomenology of everyday, epistem of everyday epistemic practice, which then needs to be bridged by various you know, theoretical devices. But the fewer of those you have, the better off you are, it seems to me. Well, here's my claim then. In everyday assertional practice, a claim may be responsibly held to or entered if, in the circumstances, nobody can think of anything to say against it. I mean, I'm going to flesh this out. If that's right, then the entitlement structure, the deontic structure of everyday assertional practice, will be default and challenge. That's also a phrase from Brandon. But the idea, it seems to me, is absolutely central to Austin in Other Minds and Sense and Sensibilia and to Wittgenstein in Uncertainty. I mean, I think the idea is way, way older than... In fact, I think Austin um, saw that defaults and challenge structures are all over our normative vocabularies. Um, something I plan to write about in the future is 
there's the commonality between Austin's um, default and challenge epistemology and his default and challenge account of moral responsibility where responsibility for the consequences of action is the default status to be relieved by an excuse as it were, a challenge to the attribution. I think Austin saw that default and challenge structures are all over the place and I think there are quite interesting semantic questions as to why the vocabulary has to work that way so I'm not going to go into that today and that's part of my research project uh, looking, looking into that but I think there's probably a deep semantic rationale for the prevalence of default and challenge structures now, now default of course justification is default it's not permanent it lapses in the face of what I call a situationally appropriate challenge and the reason I think this stays much closer to everyday um, practice is that DCS, default and challenge structure allows for a fair distribution of epistemic burdens amongst claimants and challengers there is no claimant challenger asymmetry um, you can just as well question the right to enter a challenge as you can the right to make a claim um, as a matter of fact not merely can you it's intrinsic to the rational enterprise that you should be after all if somebody says you ask you how do you know that first of all you want to know what they want to know are you asking how do I know that how do I know that how do I know that you know right I mean what's the focal point of the, of the objection for a start he asked you about me asking about the claim yeah I mean unless you know that you have no idea what to say um, and then so once that's been explained to you then you might want to know well what's wrong with that aspect of, of what I'm up to you know I mean what do you think uh, how am I falling short I mean, it's as if in the soccer game the referee says foul and then refuses to indicate what the player did wrong, you know. It's a foul because I say so. No, it isn't, actually. It's a foul because of a specific infraction. It was a bad tackle. Yeah, you went in with a high boot. You handle or whatever, right? I mean, there's no, such, there's no generic status of having committed a foul, but no foul in particular. So I think if we think of you know um, the entitlement structure of epistemic practice in a similar way, we see that the notion of the free challenge and thus of claim and challenge asymmetry is deeply implausible. We really want a fair distribution, but the only way you get a fair distribution is to recognize that the entitlement structure is default and challenge. Um, now, but suppose uh, uh, suppose that uh, a, a, a situation the appropriate challenge uh, has been entered, how do you get entitlement back? Well, by meeting it, for example, by uh, by approach, uh, producing appropriate positive reasons for making claim that outweigh the considerations uh, in, introduced by the challenger, or by introducing considerations that undermine the credibility of the challenger's um, motivations. There's a lot of fine structure to the default and challenge entitlement structure, which I'd like to go into more, but I, I won't. Just give me the broad outline here. But whatever the fine structure, I think we can see that DCS preserves the essential connection between being justified and having the ability to justify so it is justificationist but it doesn't require this insist this what i call the prior grounding conception or structure where all positive authorization goes with the claimant unless the claimant has a positive authorization the claim is not entitled or justified that's the prior grounding view uh, entitlement has to always already have to have been earned no it does so what we see is the prior grounding conception is not structured, is not required by justificationism and therefore justificationism to parche pure externalists does not lead, by itself lead to scepticism or to, C to CCA and thus to scepticism 
That said, I think that the prior grounding conception is a distortion, not a total imposition of everyday practice, not a total imposition upon it. Why is that? Because although a default and challenge uh, structure excludes free challenges, it doesn't mean that entitlement comes free. Rather, the right to default entitlement is acquired by appropriate acculturation or training. Only accredited epistemic subjects can possess entitlement, including entitlement that's default. And to be an accredited epistemic subject, one has to satisfy, and here I borrow the terminology of Jim Pryor, enabling conditions for empirical knowledge. Here's an example of Pryor's. To come to appreciate the truth of one of Euclid's theorems, I come to it uh, by studying a proof. To do, uh, to do this, I must be able to read. But my being able to read is not my reason for accepting the theorem. My reason is the proof. And I think, I think you can find, if you like, that adumbrated or anticipated and uncertainties man. I mean, yeah, you have to be able to do these things to be in a position to acquire reasons. But that you meet those enabling conditions is not a part of your reasons. The reasons, they just, they just, the enabling conditions put you in a position to acquire appropriate epistemic status in a certain way e.g. via reasons, but they are not themselves among the reasons. They belong to something other than the reasons. And Meredith calls the background to the reasons. They're not part of the reasons. Um, I happen to think that the Skepti Agrippin argument rides roughshod over that distinction. And, and that's one of the ways in which it makes the prior grounding structure look more plausible than it really ought to, to do. As a matter of fact, though, I, I, I'm willing to go further. I think um, first of all, I'm willing to say that perceptual entitlement can be treated in just the same way. The enabling conditions for perceptual entitlement or default perceptual entitlement, the right to have your observations taken at more or less face value by people around you, is your having acquired reli what Sellers calls reliable discriminative reporting dispositions. Roughly, if you say it's a woodpecker, it probably is. If this is right, then, well, two things. First of all, if you think, as I do think, you have to have mastered the observational use of some concepts to have any concepts, then you need to be more or less reliable in your, at the level of perceptual entitlement, at the level of perception, even to be in a position to enjoy entitlement anywhere. So the slogan here is, no responsibility without reliability. And that, I think, is the correct way that the, to incorporate the externalist emphasis on reliability into the broadly justificationist picture. As a matter of fact, I'd go further. I think the perceptual entitlement requires not just reliability, but reliability knowledge. You have to appreciate how reliable you are perceptually. Particularly, you have to appreciate default and challenge again, the limits of your reliability. That's to say, you have to be aware of the sorts of situations in which you're perhaps not so reliable. Not because that sort of background epistemic knowledge again has to be appealed to to establish entitlement. It doesn't. The skeptical argument shows that. And, and we could see that anyway, because typically your epistemic beliefs your second order beliefs aren't in any general way more certainly true than your first order beliefs. I mean, they're not in a, I mean, so the fact that you could, as it were, infer entitlement from second order epistemic beliefs doesn't mean that you could automatically justify first order commitments in that way because the epistemic beliefs might be, as it were, as open to question or not as the first order beliefs. So why do we have to have them? Because without them you can't recognize situationally appropriate challenges. And it's very clear in the perceptual case. You have to know that your reliability is apt to break down when things are far away or the lighting's um, bad or you've been ingesting controlled substances or whatever. You know, I mean, you've got to know that there are things that interfere with your, with your reporting reliability. 
because those interfering factors are within the default and challenge structure a prime source of situationally appropriate challenges which you will not be able to recognize or know how to respond to unless you do. Yeah, I, I, should, I should stop in there. Okay. So why does the Agrippan argument seem intuitive in the end? Well, because we don't go around stating the obvious. Um, claims to which we are default entitled generally and literally go without saying. So it's easy to overgeneralize. Suppose the assertion of entitlements as such are open to challenge, but that's wrong. Okay, I'll stop right there. Thank you. Apologies, Michael, for coming across to you, but I, no, no, I, 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 I did want to leave. Yeah, I should have stopped ages. Yeah. Questions. Yeah. Let me invite people to make questions, put questions and comments as quickly as possible. I'm, I'm wondering about the linguistic priorities, because I, I didn't really see much of that. Mm -hmm. No, there wasn't any. Sure. <laughs> and so the worry might be that does the Agrippan problem arise outside of that thesis? Here's, here's the justification, um, if you have the whole picture. Um, and it comes out somewhat more clearly in what I have to say about Cartesian skepticism. Um, but I don't think that knowledge or justified beliefs and still less do I think that phrases like beliefs about the external world or knowledge of the external world they don't pick out anything remotely like an actual kind so I think that although one can so to say at a more descriptive or phenomenological level characterize the entitlement structure of what I'm calling our practice of epistemic assessment I don't really, uh, there's a sense in which I think you can't theorize the phenomenon of knowledge because I don't think it's that kind of thing. So the justification for linguistic priority such as it is comes from seeing what taking that stance provisionally leads you to in this particular case. Pache Hugh Price, I don't think that it you know, it obviously and generally applies across the board. I mean, he says it's just a general methodological equipment of pragmatism. I think it's more of the proof the pudding is in the eating. In other words, you try it out in particular cases to see where it leads you. I mean, there's obviously lots of things we talk about that it wouldn't make sense at all. But I, I claim that if you do it in this case, then you see the strong disanalogies between scientific explanation and philosophical or epistemological understanding and that retrospectively justifies the methodology. That's the claim. Okay. Yeah, two, two responses. Your own response. Surely you're judging uh, the operation of the skeptic but with respect to a sort of method of this epistemic norm of, of default to challenge. And surely the, the, the Peronian sent the response, well, the problem is there are no operative norms. That's what the five modes do. Uh, and therefore, it would be very nice if you could appeal to that, but that doesn't work there. Related to that is, is of course, the problem in sexless is five modes and not just three. Yeah, yeah, I abstracted the agreement. Yeah, yeah, but the problem is, is, is the, 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 the significant the modes of difference and disagreement. Uh, and it's really disagreement which sets the trilemma on its sort of, you know, terminated path in, into philosophy. And it seems that what you're saying, well, if we agree, then it's not a problem. Right? And so basically the appeal to intuitions is an appeal to, to agreement. And the Peronian surely respond, well, that's fine. Presumably the problem of the possibility of disagreement, what that might do to your, the operation of your norms. But it, it, as soon as anybody disagrees, um, the whole thing's just going to fall apart, surely, for the fourth and I, the meta norm would fall, will fall apart, and your whole response to, 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 to the Agrippan problem of skepticism will fall apart. It's my suspicion. That's a very good question. Let me just say two things. To get, that they'll, in, I, mean, I could go on all day about this. Um, because it's really a version of the objection of whether the skeptic wins ties, so to say, always. So, so whether the skeptic can always, as it were, produce a kind of, you know, a set epistemic or semantic ascent, say there's no way for you to show you're right at that level, and therefore, you know, 
try one level up and then use that and then use that to go back down and, and you know try where, where he was operating to begin with. Sure, that's the Peronian view. Um, several points about this. Let me just say uh, on the point of Peronism, it's not arbitrary that I take out uh, disagreement or relativity and relativity. Um, because I happen to think, because I'm using, um, because of my generality. I mean, I think it's a contingent matter what, where there's disagreement and where there isn't. So unless you rework the, the, the Agrippan argument around the trilemma as I presented it, you won't get modally strong skepticism. And I don't think Sextus claims to have it. I mean, what he says is, we have not been able, he's very careful about this. And, and, and many of his commentators, who are much better Greek scholars than I am, I think simply fail to register this with sufficient force. He's, he's very, very careful not to formulate his skepticism in a modally strong way. So the, the, the distinction I was drawing between contingent ignorance and in principle impossibility does some work for me here. Um, and I mean, it, it, look, it's controversial in the Greek because they don't have the Ed Abel distinction syntactically marked. And a picriton could mean undecided, it could mean undecidable. My claim is if you are undecidable, then you better read the Agrippan argument the way I read it than not the way you read it. So, I mean, that would be, that, that would be one. Uh, secondly, I think one of the features about default and challenges, it tends to downplay the importance of, meta, of epistemic metanorms. Because I didn't follow this through, but actually what goes into, to, and this connects with my previous point about the difficulty of theorization, what goes into the default bag is a whole mixture of not just, so to say, general epistemic norms, but particular judgments. And as Wittgenstein says, those particular judgments often take on the prime normative function in particular dialectical situations. In other words, we reject things beca not because they fail to satisfy a general epistemic norm, but they because they conflict with first order judgments that we just can't see ourselves getting rid of. So uh, one of the features of DCS is it has a certain kind of self-protective element built in here. Namely, it downplays the centrality of epistemic norms. Okay, those two things, those will do. Please. <laughs> Um, I was interested in your distinction between understanding and uh, knowledge here, yeah. but um, a deconstruction and postmodernist uh, yeah. skepticism, which has had an enormous effect, uh, awful effect, on uh, humanities, and uh, is having such an effect. You may have uh, a problem in history, you do have, in the philosophy of history over here, never ending skepticism about that state and discussion, she must go along to them. Uh, in the Institute, not this Institute, the Institute of Historical Studies, uh, but you also have the skepticism about meaning. And this is very important in deconstruction. And uh, the idea that you can never know the text. Um, it had a huge effect on the um, Yeah. Well, um, look, those are huge issues, but let me just indicate what I think about them. Um, the first thing is, I think it's... Remember I said skepticism is radical, okay? It's not high standards. It's not certainty skepticism. It's justificational skepticism. Um... I think there's a tremendous tendency in the history of philosophy, which I happen to think the postmodernist argument simply continues, to play fast and loose with, to ally the distinction between fallibilism and radical skepticism. I mean, it's one thing to say you can't get things right with certainty or definitively because new things could always come along, e.g., in the case of texts. New, new things can come along so that inferential commitments you hadn't noticed 
suddenly become salient because e.g. the way you in, incline to read the text now clashes with something that you, you'd never thought about until some further text was produced to make you think about it. Okay, so that's fallibilism. You can always revise. That's not equivalent to the view that every view is always as good as every other, you know. I mean, it just means it just means you can change your mind when you need to. I, and I, I think that distinction, it's, I, I'm not going to pick on the postmodernists here. I mean, I think that distinction's all over the place. Uh, that, the, the, the lizard of that distinction is all over the history of skepticism. Because fallibilism is often really plausible. After all, we are vastly error prone. But I don't happen to think you can get from that um, observation, which I'm inclined to think is true, to, the, to radical skepticism. And I think people try to do it all the time. Oh, but I say you can't get. You can't get without a good deal of theoretical help. And then that's where my intuitiveness thing, you know, I mean, because after all, you know, you can argue for anything you like one way or another. I mean, you have free choice of premises. So, I mean, so I would always focus, well, when someone tries to get from fallibilism to radical skepticism, what was the theoretical bridge? Um, I also think about meaning. I mean, skepticism about meaning comes in grades. And, and uh, I, 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 I do think... Uh, although I don't, uh, which is what's right about po postmodernism, is that meaning is a contextually sensitive and interest relative notion. It's not a scientific notion, but I think you can do philosophy of language without meaning. I think Quine and Davidson showed us how to do it, and uh, and sell us. I mean. Uh, I think, I think that was one of the achievements of the pragmatic strand in Anglophone philosophy, is that it showed you could do philosophy of language without meanings, indeed without making theoretical no use of any notion of representation. Uh, that's another long story, okay, but I mean, so um, I think postmodernists are probably closet representationalists. That's what, that's what I think. Let's, let's try and squeeze in one more question yeah. before we have to close. My, I was wanting and to... We'll go, if we can get it. Yeah, you. We, yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's get two quick ones. Okay. Okay. Wanted something a little bit stronger uh, when, when we ask about the right to default to entitlement and you say acquired by learning and training. Mm -hmm. This is a sort of stage of learning and training that looks like it plays right into one of the... Um, the horns of the trilemma for the equipment, and that's where, you know, part of the practice of learning to give and take reasons is where children ask why, 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 and they're told, because I say so, or they get the dialectical slap. <laughs> right. and, and one wonders whether the closing down of that, you don't want to make that essentially part of the training, you want rather a way of defending the practice and its grounds of uh, training and learning to show why, had they not been in place, there would be no such practice and things couldn't proceed in the way that they have to proceed. It needs to be stronger than just a stopping place. Don't agree. I mean, I think you have to, you know, in order to get them comfortable with default and challenge, um, you can't do it by persuasion. Persuasion takes place within the structure. The structure itself is inculcated by telling them not to, giving them the dialectical slap and telling them not to ask silly questions. I, I really do believe that. So, I mean, um, but you know, um, you know, otherwise you don't get the rules of the game. If you're not careful, you, know, you end up with the view that. You have to teach children philosophy of mathematics before we just make them add up. Why is it nine after eight? Because I say so. You want them to get, <laughs> them to get two or three deep, right? You want them to get a Eventually. Right. But look, I mean, the reliable discriminative disposition stuff comes way before the level of reflected knowledge which is required to play the game of defending perceptual entitlement. I mean, sometimes you just have to be, you just have to look pleased when they say pussycat. Um, you know, they don't need a, what an extraordinarily astute remark, Jeremy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes, indeed, it is the cat. No, you don't need that. Just, that's good. That's, that's I'll give you. Yeah. Well, I just want to clarify how you're thinking about the dialectic. So, initially, you set the great store by the idea that the dialectic would be intuitive and that. We needed a response that approached it diagnostically and not just dismissively or dialectically. Yeah. So, 
Um, in your response, you brought up the CCA and then um, said that it derived from prior grounding structure and then that contrasted with our standard practice, which is supposed to be before the challenge. So yeah. at that stage, we are just responding to the argument dialectically. Is, is that is that how you're thinking of the argument? Or is that already a diagnosis itself? Oh, I think it's, a, it's part of the theoretic diagnosis in itself because I think of CCA as already the first steps towards the theorization of, of, of the entire... I mean, normally, normally, I mean, whatever the entitlement structure is, you know, we observe it in practice, right? So CCA is already making explicit, allegedly, some aspect of the entitlement structure that we are trained to conform to. Now, um, I think, I, I didn't get enough time to go into this, but I think on the face of it, we now conform to that structure. I mean, that, that there's actually a sharing of, of just, a complex sharing of justificational burdens between claimants and challengers, right? So, so then the question would be, well, why do people think that nevertheless the, the, the CCA is plausible? Okay, then you take the diagnosis one step further deep. They have an alternative structure in mind, what I call the prior grounding structure rather than default and challenge structure. And then why do they think that? Well, then the argument is um, they think it and, and it, in, and it looks plausible to think it because of this generalized, uh, of, because of this over hasty generalization from what is in fact characteristic of specific problematic situations, which are the most prominent in our epistemic practices, to a, an account of the general structure of those practices. So, so it's all diagnostic, but it goes in. It, it goes in levels. By, by way of contrast, how would your um, how would your strategy differ from someone who went to the, uh, from went went ahead and directly attacked one of the premises of of the, the, the argument setting up this dilemma. Because very likely they will also have some sort of, uh, they will draw strength from their response by noticing that it also uh, violates some aspect of our epistemic practice. I don't think the distinction between, I mean, I, the distinction between a diagnostic and a direct response, um, I think, is not theoretically deep, it's sensitive to the canonical formulation of a skeptical argument. Though I do think, in fact, the canonical formulations typically avoid making explicit um, the commitments that I take to be brought out by theoretical diagnosis. In fact, this is even clearer in the Cartesian case, um, people are typically inclined to resist the claim that the commitments one attributes are really need to be attributed, and to seek alternative formulations of the argument in which it's in which they're you know not so clearly present. So, um, and you know, I, I think there's a I think there's a reason for that. I mean, if CCA and, and, and its connections with PGS and all the rest of it were just right out there up front, the argument would be much less compelling than it seems to be in its stripped down form. So, I do think. I do think there's something philosophically significant about the brevity of the most long-lived skeptical arguments, like the regress argument, like the first meditation argument, in their canonical formulation. Of course, you could always, ex I mean, you could think of, of what I call theoretical diagnosis of ex as explicitation, of actually bringing out what the argument really has to be to work. I mean, fine. And then, of course, sure, attack one of the premises. Um, even then, of course, though, you may not end up, if you go my route, with an exactly direct answer. That's to say, you may not be proving to be true something the skeptic says is false. You might be, as it were, as I am, arguing that there's a sense in which the alternative to the skeptic's view also leads you to think that the practices aren't as deeply theorizable as the skeptic's argument requires, and that, I think, is a difference that would remain even at the end after we'd been through all this reformulation.